were your parents, uh, were you learning business stuff or uh, what influence were your parents having on your life at this time? Well, they taught me discipline, respect, perseverance, and hard work and, and sense. Taught me how to be very intelligent. Well, that's good. Hell yeah, because ain't nobody pulling shit over on me. Well, that uh, speaking of that, well, uh, on Come On, Let's Move It, that was one of the more interesting things about that song to me was the second verse when you're talking about not that you rap to make money, but because you like it and it's like constructive and it's mentally fulfilling to you to rap. So, and how you were actually seeking education. So that always stood out to me about that verse in particular and about your whole mentality and I guess how you were looked at, I guess, or how you, I guess more how you presented how yourself. How you view things. How you presented right. yourself. Like, yeah, so. Yeah, well, that's, cause that's me. That's how I feel. Like, I don't have to, uh, I can make a song about having things, but I don't have to walk around like, you know, like that. I don't have to walk around dropping money out my pocket and furs dragging on the floor and shit like that. I'm not into that. You know, I'm, I'm into real uh, manly shit, building shit, renovating, doing stuff. You know what I'm saying? Work, manual labor. I do every. I, 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 I'm a. I like to master things. I like to be a uh, craftsman. Like I, I, I do anything. I do everything. How about that? I cut hair. I don't care what it is. I can do it well because when I do something, I like to um, definitely focus and do it well. I like to shine in everything I do. So whether I don't care what it is, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to do it well. And also shooting, shooting I'm going to shoot well. I'm going to shoot my bullseye. Yeah. Uh, and you also uh, shout out your parents on the song, which I always thought was interesting and cool because, of course, the perception is a lot of people don't have good relationships with their parents or what have you. So why was it important or significant for you to shout them out on Come On, Let's Move It? Because I do. I'm not most people. Most people that have bad relationships have some things they need to work on. If you have a bad relationship with your parent, you definitely have some things to work on internally. Or your parents may have something to work on, but it's always important to um, know the importance of family. Absolutely. And then one of the big singles on this album was The Mission, of course. And this was probably your most famous story song. And it was a very James Bondian I would say, and uh, the video was much different, I'd say, than all your other videos to this point. And it was like a mini movie. So when you wrote the song, did you know it was going to be a single? And did you start thinking about the video immediately? No, um, I just wanted it to be a story that you could visualize when you hear it. That was actually the second version. The mission actually had an original version that was too hard edge. There was cussing in it, there was guns popping off, there was people getting popped. So Profile didn't want that to become a part of my image at the time. I was 15. But to me, it was just amusing. It was like a, a, a funny story. You know, like I now a rapper be like, yo, I got a story to tell you, it's a funny story. And they rap, but same thing I did. But then there was a lot more censorship. This was prior to uh, the whole NWA thing. Free NWA. Um, when you had written it, you mean? What's that? When you wrote it, you mean? Yeah. Okay. When I wrote it, recorded it, everything. It was it was it was pre NWA. I mean, they probably just came out with a single or something. Okay. We really kind of came out around the same time, but I'm I'm talking about when I was recording. Gotcha. Okay. Because right? remember, I recorded that song a year prior to its release. Right. Because. People always forget now because it, everything is so fast that it used to take right. months for recording and then months later the album to actually come out. It was a process. Yeah, it was, 
because it was all analog. Yeah, it's very different. Now it's digital. You could put a song out the next day. <laughs> yeah. You could put a song out the same night. It's a very the same different night you mix it. Very different reality. Absolutely. So this album also has the magnificent remix of I'm the Magnificent. So why uh did you guys want to put that on this album? Well, because it wasn't on the first album and I personally liked it better than the original. And to be honest, even though I like the um the sample, I didn't like it for that song. I thought it was a cool beat, but I didn't want that wasn't the style of the lyrics that I was spitting to it. So how he actually ended up remixing it. How he remixed everything. How he is the king of the remix. Original king of the remix. Ain't nobody remix like how we t period from day one so let me just say that now how we came back with uh the magnificent remix and i was like yeah that's it that was more of a beat in the style of what i heard in my head with those lyrics okay the original was the original was not i, I just did it because i was loyal to the game so how he was like yo spit on this i like the beat but then when i spit the lyrics i was like man it's all right so what just let it fly what didn't match to you about it what was it i don't know it was just bang and bang and bang and and the lyrics was more of a um see i had some different styles when i wrote and the and that was more of a um like a talk style like a, you know conversing you know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. The other beat just kind of threw me off. It was like the, the, the flow of it. Ding, 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 ding. I mean, you know, that I wanted something funky, groovy. You know what I'm saying? And not spring, springy, springy. That was springy. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. And then going on with the the remix and then the uh, the mission. And you were also obviously getting older at the time. What role did this decision making, a lot of it sound like it was maintaining or looking at being very careful about your image. So how did, how did you work with the label or was this all on you to how to present yourself to the public? Well, it was basically on me, but they would put restrictions on certain things. So. If they heard something that was a little too raw, they'd be like, we don't want it. That's a little too raw. And remember, this is 30 years ago, so there was a lot more censorship. I mean, NWA was really the first ignorant rap. Like, totally ignorant shit. You know what I'm saying? And when I say that, it made perfect sense, but I meant the content in rap that was unheard of. Like, no one said those type of things on records. That's what they were trying to stay away from. That's what they kept us from doing for years. They censored us. So when they came out and did that, it was like, look at this shit. You're censoring everybody and these motherfuckers go like 10 times platinum or whatever because they ratchet, because they saying all kinds of, you know, things. Yeah. Okay. And then on your Wish You Could, that was one where you produced on that one and at that time you know how would you chart your progression as a producer on legal on song like you wish you could well you wish you could was produced by my brother wayne under my production so basically what i do is when i buy equipment it ain't just for me it's for everybody it's for everybody to learn, for everybody to grow, and for everybody to uh, exceed and, and advance in life. So I bought the, the, the same setup that Howie had, and I put it in my mom's house and started a production company, Special Ed Music. So my brother Wayne would uh, act as the engineer or producer. He would sit there and do the sampling and do the sequencing and put things together. So, yeah, that, and that's basically how I did for a long time with various producers under my production. And some of them, 
I physically sat there and did, but for me, it was more of me orchestrating production and enabling others. Like, if I could sit there and say, okay, loop that, loop that, loop that, and not have to sit there and actually physically do it, that's best for me. It came to a point where I actually did have to do it for a while, though, you know, from moving around in, in different things, different setups and studios and situations. So, but I, I've taught quite a few people to trade, how to produce. And um, a lot of them have gone on to do great things. A lot of them have gone on to teach their children how to produce. And um, they're doing well for themselves as well. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, you wish you could. That was produced in house by me and Wayne. And um, that was the, the second album was the, because what let me tell you what happened. The first album, when I was picking samples and doing things, Howie T tried to give me production credit. And I told him no. I didn't know. I was 15. Wow. I went to him for the chance. I went to him for the opportunity, and he gave me the opportunity. So I consider myself the lyricist. I'm the writer. I'm writing people's records. So when he says, you know, you produced it or whatever, I'm like, nah, man, don't worry about that. You the producer. I'm the I'm the writer. I'm the lyricist. You're the produ you're the producer. So you just produce. And then when I kind of learned the business and saw how other producers were producing in the same fashion, it's like, okay, well, I am producing. So let me go ahead and produce now. You understand? I didn't realize that I was producing. I thought that I was just making suggestions. But in reality, I was picking out my samples, my drums. You know what I'm saying? How to sequence things, what I wanted, you know? So, yeah, that's production. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And back then, you had to have like 10 different machines connected. It wasn't like now it is a computer or it's digital and everything is synced up. You had to have a drum machine, a sequencer, a keyboard, all separately synced up. Samplers synced up. Everything that you wanted to play with had to be synced up. It was a whole different, and then tape to a reel to reel. Yeah, it was a whole rig. It was a process. Yes. Very different from today. Yeah. And one of my favorite songs on legal is the ready to attack and oh, yeah. from the mom too and i think uh one of the reasons i like it is because i think you work really well or at least in this era of your career worked really well with super or well, faster beats or at least had a more of a feel of faster beats so what do you think that that uh that speed or that feeling brings out of you differently as a writer or your flow um, I, I think it just enables you to kind of go harder. When it's a laid back beat, I'm gonna lay back on it. When it's a harder beat, I'm gonna go harder on it. That's all. And um, you know, I could really kind of go into that battle zone, go into that mental zone where I'm tearing somebody down. Okay. And that's what I that's what I do. Gotcha. So I got yeah. a lot of, I got a lot of that on the first verse, but the second verse is my favorite, where you're talking about gold and history and yeah yeah well you know i like to put a little jewelry in my in my words you know what i'm saying i like to put some lessons and i like to teach people something or say something and that's just part of me and and, and it's a part of my character so what i'm really doing is teaching you who i am and how i feel and how i look at things so that you don't think i'm out here okay why he don't have this why he don't have that i'm gonna tell you why so you understand me clearly so when you never ever see it, you know why. So that's what that was really about. Okay. And I also like too the uh, breakdown with the week, the days of the week, how you were like. Yeah. So, uh, as a writer, when you're doing that, when you're done, do you like what do you sit back and like, oh man, that was kind of clever. You just move on to the next or what? Oh yeah, no. Nah, I mean, I'm gonna move on to the next anyway. But that definitely was clever, and I think how I came to that determination was um, talking, and then I was like, um, you know, a school. I was thinking of like teaching them, and then I'm like, well, shit, I'm busy, but I could fit you in on Monday at three, let's say, right? And then why? Because 
Every other day is busy. All the way through Sunday, right? And then how? Let me tell you how. This is that, that's that, that's that, 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 that. So it was really the, it was, it's a conversation that I'm having. You know, I'm telling you, I'm saying, yo, I should, you know, I should teach y'all how to ride. I open up a school, man. I, I, I open class. As a matter of fact, maybe Mondays, you know, just like I'm saying, maybe Mondays at three. So it's really a conversation I'm having. Okay. So, so, so that's how the rhymes go. I just make it rhyme. I just make my conversation rhyme. Hmm. So I'm telling you something with a point to it, but I'm making it rhyme. I'm not trying to rhyme words together. That's not what I do. I talk to you and I make the, the, the conversation rhyme. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.